all about New Zealand, an online database, and making YouTube videos with Michael J. Burns. Stay inspired. Could you touch a bit on just how you got introduced to the bassoon and composition? Starting on the bassoon, I, um, I had been um, growing up, I'm, I'm from a pretty musical family. Um, I'm the youngest of, of five kids and um, all but one of my siblings um, are, are musicians and the other one is a very keen audience member um, and fantastic with languages which I think has a correlation and my parents uh, my mother would sing all the time but not formally but my, my father started playing all kinds of instruments and I took piano lessons when I was younger and then really wanted to play an instrument in an ensemble um, and I did a thing that uh, I guess it's not uncommon, which is sort of listening to the Peter and the Wolf and, and Young Person's Guide to the Orchestra and, and other things to sort of decide which, which instrument seem, seemed like it would be good. And I had narrowed it down more or less to the horn and the bassoon. And then uh, one of my best friends at, at school uh, started to take horn lessons. And so I was like, well, I'm not going to be a copycat. <laughs> I'll, I'll choose the bassoon and that's sort of how how that started and then I think now after many years playing the bassoon and and I still love the horn but I don't know that I could have handled all of those close partials and all of the transposition and all of the, the other things that they deal with I mean we've got our own problems but anyway I think I, I chose okay uh, they'll probably look at us and say, well, we don't have to make reads and we don't have all of those thumb keys. So uh, I guess it's a trade-off. <laughs> uh, composition has really, was just sort of something that I more or less always did growing up. And I, I think I may have related a, a, a story about how there have been a few times where, you know, I've heard interviews with, with, like real composers, where they sometimes talk about sort of having a muse at, or, or feeling like they are um, a conduit um, to bring the music into the world, that, that it sort of comes into their head. And, they, and I, I must say that I've experienced that maybe a couple of times where um, I'm, I'm singing in the shower and then I'm like, what is that? And then I realize it's something I have to write down. Um, and the strange thing about when the, those sort of experiences have happened is that it, it um, it's very persistent. And if I don't write it down, it just starts annoying me more and more until, until I do something about it. And for whatever reason, um, maybe as life has become busy and all that sort of thing, I have not, I've not been composing as much in recent years. Um, what I've actually been doing a little bit is going back over some of my earlier year pieces and sort of revising some of those and rewriting them or stealing good bits and putting them into some other piece. But um, yeah, it was a, it's definitely a passion. I, I do think that it, that has had quite an influence on how I play and how I teach the bassoon, because I think it's important to try to realize some things structurally about the music and some things contextually about the music. And so I do feel that at, at times I approach things from a composer's perspective, which I think can be different than the performers. Some of it's even, even as, as um, mundane as when a composer writes, you know, the same music in two different places, but it has different um, articulations or dynamics or something and oh thanks Stacy uh, um, and it then I have a discussion about you know like it might there might be a slur one time and there's not the other time or, or a forte one time and there's not the other time and, I, and I'll have a, a bit of a discussion sometimes about well sometimes as a composer a you forget 
especially before the, the age of cut and paste now. Or actually, sometimes you cut and paste and you accidentally have like something come over that you didn't mean to. Um, so you're doing a repeat and it's like, oh, I already wrote this. Let me just find that and, you know, just like word processing. Um, so the, the old style, you know, writing it out by hand music, I think, especially if we're looking back at some of these um, really well-known, really prolific composers, that um, if you look at the, of course, Urtext editions of Mozart stuff, there's hardly any dynamics and hardly any articulations. And I think that was pretty, pretty common. But you look at somebody like uh, Poulenc was incredibly inconsistent. <laughs> and it's like, well, do we, should we play it the same way as he wrote it one time when it comes back the next time? Or is it deliberate that he left? So sometimes I'll have sort of some, some discussions about that, that from the composer point of view, sometimes it's just like, I don't, you can you can extrapolate what what I'm thinking, what I'm thinking, or sometimes I think too. Actually, a lot of times I think when we're playing music from other time periods, there are norms and expectations that everybody at that time had um, that might have gotten lost in the intervening years. So now, of course, when we're playing historically informed things, it seems like every time you turn around, there's a new interpretation of the same piece of music because maybe some new information has come to light about you know, a piece, about, well, how do, should we ornament and how should we, um, you know, how do we approach when something is written this way, every other piece that is written at this time does this, so therefore should we just think that this joins in that? that uh, trend. I think occasionally it, with a piece of music, um, I, 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 actually, let me, let me relay what I think is a, an interesting story um, times two. So um, I, one of the pieces that I recorded on um, my first solo CD was a piece that I wrote for bassoon and piano. Uh, to Altero sketches. And I had the interesting experience of having my producer tell me that I was playing it wrong because of what he had on the page and what and how I was playing it. And then, um, actually, not that much later, I had a student who um, has gone on to become a very successful composer. Uh, I've had a few students composers uh, in my studio. Um, this one, Trevor Bumgarner, and he's won all kinds of awards and, and, and um, uh, he got a grant from Juilliard, like a, like a, not a genius grant exactly, but it was basically, we're going to give you all this money to, to do great things for a year or two. Um, anyway, so Trevor had written a piece for bassoon and piano and he was bringing it into his lesson. And I sort of did the same thing to him. He was playing it. I'm like, so do you want to do what's on, what the composer wrote or do you want to do what you're doing? And so I've, I've, I've expanded upon that occasionally when somebody is playing something and, and you know, there can be that element of um, trying to, trying to determine what they actually meant because notation is flawed. Notation is not exact. And so we can be exact, and sometimes that's not actually going to get across the correct musical meaning. So um, another experience I've had is, is playing a, um, a lot of new music uh, and sometimes premiering music, but where you know, somebody has written something extremely rhythmically complex. It's like you have to do 13 in the time of nine uh, in a 5-8 measure, you know, and it's, you're just kind of doing this high math and going, uh and, and um, playing it for the composer and trying to be so accurate. And it's like, no, 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 it goes like this and they'll sing it and it's just free. So then I play it totally free and like, yes, that's it. Like, okay, I got that. But I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of gestural, particularly now, but I think also if you look back at, through music history, there's a lot of gestures 
that look very intimidating on the page, but that sometimes what is actually meant is easier to, to execute. So anyway, just things like that that, that come up in, in conversations and in, in, certainly in the course of some of the lessons where we're looking at a piece and then determining well, well how should we do it, what, um, how exact should we be about notation. If it's not the same, the two different times, does that mean we have to play it differently? Because we also all know that people say if something's repeated, you shouldn't do it the same way. Maybe the composer's doing that, you know? And so anyway, there's discussions of those sorts. For everyone listening, Stacy mentioned, I love playing the Three Winds Trio. Could you tell us about the Three Winds Trio? Sure. So um, Stacy, you're not saying the, the correct Maori name. It's Etoro no Hao, uh, which translates to the Three Winds. And the original version of that is for is a reed trio for oboe, clarinet, bassoon, but there are different iterations of it. There's a saxophone trio, um, uh, soprano, alto, baritone. Um, there is a version. It's easy to substitute flute in for the oboe. There are, we've done all kinds of configurations of, of, of that piece, but it's a it's a um, two movement. Piece. I, I seem to have a habit of writing two movement pieces as opposed to three or, or more. Um, and it, uh, it definitely does have a lot of jazz influences, as, as Stacey also talks about. And so part of my um, musical background uh, was also as a, a drummer, particularly a jazz drummer, but also in assorted rock bands and, and other things as well. And so I think um, rhythmically and harmonically and, and to some extent melodically, those things come up in my music quite a lot. And Stacy has also shared, you seem to have some jazz influences in your music as well. So does that play into that idea of freedom of interpretation as well? Yeah, definitely playing into the, the idea of freedom of interpretation. And, it's interesting um, what I've tended to do, though, is not as free as, as true jazz in that I've essentially written out improvisation, like I've written out a passage for people to play that s could sound like they're improvising it. Um, and so, there have been times that I've played, you know, gotten to play some of my pieces with some true jazzers who put aside what I've written <laughs> and actually play, um, you know, the, the jazz changes, the chords and stuff, and, and uh, that's a lot of fun when that, that happens. But yeah, it, it, it does, um, it definitely ties in with, with the freedom of inter interpretation thing. Um, and yet, I think as a composer, it can be challenging to me when I hear somebody else play my music not in the way that I expected it. And because my first reaction can be, oh, they're doing it wrong. And I'm like, no, actually, they're, they're playing what I wrote. If I don't like it that way, I need to be more precise about how I write it. And that's actually also been a revelation for me as a, as a performer. Um, even when I think I'm being very literal about the page, there could, you, know, you could listen to multiple interpretations of the exact same music on the page from different players. And you could argue that they're all doing it correctly. So how, how does that happen? So it's, it's sort of, I find that somewhat fascinating. Thinking about the explanation of pieces of works before the, the manuscript, do you spend a lot of time like writing that or kind of use that to influence how the music is played? I don't tend to spend a whole lot of time writing that. I guess I, I have not thought about <laughs> what an influence it might have on, on the person. It's tended to be, oh, I have, we have
have to have programs in next week. I better write something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then usually that whatever that is just stays with it for, uh -huh. for the duration. Occasionally I go back and then go, oh, I shouldn't have written that. I should write something else more coherent about it. But um, as an interpreter, uh, you know, if you if you get a, a piece of music that um, has like a descriptive title or even a descriptive um, uh, tempo indication, like, like the first movement of the Telemann F minor sonata, triste, right, means sad, and, and go, oh, well, of course it means slow, but it means a lot more than that. So I think sometimes there, there can be things that are indicated by the composer with, within the music. One could argue, I think, that also the, there are some, I don't know how to, how to put it exactly, there are, there are some, some sort of cliches, there are some sort of um, uh, standard ways of thinking about music. I, I've, I've brought in some pieces of music to a student, you know, maybe it's a, an etude or maybe it's a, um, a piece of solo repertoire, and they play it and I say, what, what do you think the character is here? And if it is, let's say, martial uh, in character with lots of you know, dotted rhythms and lots of other things, it's very common that they'll say something that relates to that or relates to, to oh, I think this is somebody famous arriving or this is, and I think there's, there are certain um, musical ideas and gestures that seem to, at least in Western art music, um, seem to convey a similar feeling to many different people in many different places. Um, now, I'm sure a lot of that is, is culturally based. You know, we're watching TV and we hear music of a certain kind and we see the images associated with that and we go, oh, okay. But it seems also that there's just certain things that, that we hear. We can kind of tell when something's a love theme we can kind of tell when it's supposed to be conveying a storm. I mean, some some of it is is you know um, uh, text painting painting, but with music, right? So the storm in, in numerous pieces of music, with portrayals of thunder and rain and and wind, and we go, yeah, it's a storm, you know. So I, I you know there are some things like that. There are some that are a lot more. Um, open-ended but anyway I'm, I'm babbling on but but I think you know if we and when we do have a piece that somebody uh, you know the composer in particular has written um, you know a dedication to or it's for this specific purpose that to me actually can, can um, open a window certainly it would be lovely to hear more about your experience moving from New Zealand to the United States. Could you talk a little bit about that? I, I certainly could. And, and it's very appropriate, Julie, that you use the word lovely. I, I think that the, the country of New Zealand, if they removed that word from the lexicon, <laughs> would grind to a halt. Because yeah, um, right. for any of you who have never been to New Zealand, um, you say, oh, it's a lovely day today. Uh, oh, this is a lovely meal. Wouldn't it be <laughs> lovely to go for a walk? Oh, that person. Oh, Julie, she's so lovely. Uh, <laughs> everybody, I, I recall distinctly getting off one of my earlier times coming back to New Zealand after having been living in the States for a little while and stepping off the plane and in the airport, I think within the first two minutes, I probably heard the word lovely about 80 <laughs> times. Anyway, to your question. So when I was growing up, and I, I don't know if it is, is still the same there or not, but there was a very um, strong desire and even to some extent a formalized kind of, of appreciation for New Zealand to, New Zealanders to get their overseas experience, their OE. And even to the point that if two equally qualified candidates applied for a job and one had done their OE and the other hadn't, 
that the one that had been away is much more likely to get the job. So with with studying, um, you know, bassoon, uh, of course, being a uh, less common instrument than most, I basically studied with all of the, the bassoonists that I, I possibly could at that time in New Zealand. And so it was like, well, it's 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 time to leave. And, and my, my teacher, who um, Colin Hemmingson, who was the principal bassoon of the New Zealand Symphony Orchestra at that time, um, had studied in Boston with, with Sherman Walt, so I I wrote Mr. Walt a letter and sent him a cassette tape of my uh, um, recitals from my undergraduate degree that I did in, in New Zealand. And he graciously accepted me into his studio, and so I ended up going over to Boston. And my original thought was I would do a two-year master's degree and then return back to New Zealand triumphant and, um, I don't know, win one of the very few positions that were there. Now, at the time that I left the, the section in the New Zealand Symphony Orchestra, the NZSO, as we would call it there, um, there's typically a three-person section, and occasionally it grows to four, and then it comes back to three and goes back and forth. But usually sort of a principal, a second, and um, assistant principal, and the contra person. Well, at the time I left in my uh, early 20s to go, go to Boston, the oldest member of the NZSO was my teacher who was in his mid-30s or something. So, <laughs> and that was the, at that time the only um, full-time professional orchestra in New Zealand. Since that time, um, the Auckland uh, Symphony has, has come along and it is, it also has full-time professional. And there are other, many other groups in, in the country that are, are um, part-time professional. Um, so anyway, uh, I came over to, to do my, my studies and um, some of the things Julie and I were talking about before the beginning of, of, of uh, this um, interview was just the, the, the I'm going to say culture shock. Mm. Uh, I mean, I, I think I felt that I knew I thought that I knew the American culture based upon television shows and, and news reporting and, and, and other things of the kind, but there were, there were some unexpected differences. Um, we were talking about that, that at times this English language that we're both supposedly speaking can seem quite different from each other. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, that the same word will have a very different meaning mm. in the two places. So um, an exa a, a great example is a biscuit. Uh, <laughs> a biscuit in New Zealand is what an American would call a cookie. Mm -hmm. um, and a biscuit in America, what is, is almost like a form of scone. <laughs> Or you'd have and it. And then a stone favorite. or a scone yeah. over here is like another version, but not quite the same as the New Zealand. So anyway, it's very confusing because you'll you'll say a word, uh, or even the way you pronounce a word, can be quite quite different in the two places. But I remember the my first night in Boston. First of all, there was a um, unfortunate comedy of errors, and the per, the New Zealand. Uh, musician that was living in, in Boston that I was supposed to stay with, we'd gotten our wires crossed and they thought I was coming a different week and they were out of town. And I didn't find that out until I basically landed at Logan Airport in Boston. And so then I had to get in a cab and, and I, <laughs> I asked them to take me to the YMC, to the YMCA and they're like, uh -huh. which one? My, uh, and anyway, the one I wanted, I knew that there was one immediately adjacent to New England Conservatory, which is in Back Bay, and I eventually got to the right one. Um, and they, they took me there, and the, the taxi drove away, and I came in with all of my suitcases, and it was, I don't know, 11.30 at night. And they're like, we don't have any rooms. <laughs> so I had to call another cab. And I got in the cab, and I basically, I think the, the, luckily it was a sympathetic cab driver, and, and I'm like, um, can you find 
find me a hotel somewhere um, that won't be too expensive and is not too far from where we are here. And, and he, he did. And I, I eventually I get checked in and I go to this hotel and I'm going up to my room and the room's in darkness and the, the light switch is in what to me in New Zealand is the on position. I'm like, oh great, after all this I get to my room and the light bulb is blown or something. So I don't know, being brought up um, to conserve energy, I go to turn it off and the light comes on and I'm like, I'm in a different country. I, that was the thing that really struck me. The light? You know, after, yeah. after, because I, I, I knew about the other, well, also with the cab drivers, you know, getting used to tipping in New Zealand, tipping. That's yeah, the we don't. And I was like, oh, yeah, I have to do that. I didn't understand. So, you know, there were a number of, of cultural things. I mean, my wife and I still occasionally will have a conversation where some one of us says something to the other one and we're like, what language are you speaking? <laughs> you know, we just don't, don't understand. Um, she's originally from Tallahassee, Florida, and I remember one of the early dinners that she made for, for us that she was like, uh, go ahead and dip up and blah, 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 blah. And I was like, do, do what? Dip it up. Dip it up. I had no idea what she, what she was talking about. It, it, it's like serve the plate, you know. Okay, I didn't know that that plate. either. Actually, did well, and, that and, and of course, all of her family knew that, and that's. But but I, I thought she was speaking Martian for a. a period of time. <laughs> and, and there have been things that I've said that she's like, "What what are you talking about?" Mm -hmm. And so we've learned to just say cultural difference. Yes. Um, now and then, and just sort of um, work out, you know, what what the differences are. So it was also interesting at NEC, you know, coming from New Zealand, I was very much um, a big fish in a very small pond. And I arrived at NEC. So after all of that experience, and then I couldn't sleep all night because I was jet lagged. And so I'm blurry eyed after like half an hour of sleep or something, wandering the practice room hallways. And there were 20 something bassoons wow. all practicing because we had ensemble auditions coming up. Um, and I'm hearing, you know, going from one room to another going, oh my gosh, what have I done? They all sound fabulous. <laughs> and, um, and so anyway, it was, it was kind of eye opening to go from literally being the only bassoon during my undergraduate degree. Uh, and then across town was the only uh, other bassoon in town. Um, our friend Hamish Keach, who's now much more well known in the conducting realm. Yeah. Um, but, uh, Yes, so it was was quite a, quite a different experience in that regard. And also, um, you and I, we, I, I'm going to steal one of your topics from you. I think we, we talked about how the the educational system yes. is is pretty different between the two countries. And one of the uh, big differences is that um, in New Zealand, uh, when I was there, but I think it's still more or less the same. Mm -hmm. um, what is the equivalent of the liberal arts classes in um, the US, which are part of your college experience or university experience, are typically done in your last couple of years of high school. And so then when you do the degrees, most, most undergraduate bachelor's degrees in New Zealand are three year degrees that are purely specific on the, on the topic that you're taking. So when I did my music degree, I only had music classes, um, and they were they were very, very in, intensive. But um, another difference that um, ended up being, I, I thought to some extent that I had a disadvantage, but I think there were in some ways that I had an advantage, is that for the time I came up, and I think it's still primarily this way in New Zealand. Um, we did not have um, band class or orchestra class. We would do band and orchestra extracurricularly. So we would meet before school, during lunch, and after school. Um, what we did have as core curriculum when I was going through, everybody in high school had to take some music theory and some music history. 
everybody had to. I think some of that, unfortunately, is has uh, been axed. But that was actually fantastic because um, what it meant is that those people that were actually in the ensembles were dedicated to really playing in them. And they also had some understanding of the history and the theory of, of what they were playing and what they were doing. Um, but what I felt, you know, when I was walking the hallways in the NEC, these kids had been um, playing their instruments in class, you know, for forever and, and in, in very competitive situations already. And then to get into, you know, an institution like that, they were, they were really, really good. And my um, saving grace was that in New Zealand, the, the tradition is much more from the English, the brass band tradition. So the, the um, brass players and the percussionists would play in brass band, and I would join them sometimes on percussion. But when I was playing bassoon, I was playing an orchestra. And I played bassoon and orchestra from like age 13 up. And so certainly all the way through high school. And so that was just the most natural thing for me. And even though I imagine that some people probably blew me out of the water in terms of how they played the placement excerpts, I think somebody could tell that I knew my way around an orchestra and I actually was placed as principal on the whole first concert, which was nice and intimidating. The guy, the clarinetist I was sitting next to um, now plays with the Cleveland Orchestra. And, <laughs> and um, anyway, so uh, it, it, it ended up being really good, good for me in that regard. And, and I do think that it's quite a different aesthetic um, for all of you bassoonists listening, the aesthetic of playing in an orchestra versus the aesthetic of playing in a band, um, where if you're doubled in orchestra in much of the music, it's the cellos and the basses or the violas, maybe some trombones and stuff here and there, but, but not like in band where it's, you know, all of the lower saxes, the trombones, the tubas, the everybody else. And, and um, so I think you learn your role in the ensemble differently in that kind of context. You mentioned about two of your students doing exchanges. Could you share a bit more about that? Um, yes. Yeah, so um, as many American universities, do, well, as many universities do, we have um, exchange programs where sometimes it's from our university to another specific university, and sometimes we're part of the University of North Carolina system, which has 17 or 18 campuses and another system. Um, so I had um, both of those students were um, double majors doing bassoon and something else. So one of them um, has ended up now doing, um, the one who went to New Zealand, has ended up doing um, uh, music therapy. And the other one was doing bassoon and biology and went to Sydney and was do, like doing, um, um, basically looking at a whole lot of the aquatic creatures and stuff around Sydney and was having a great time. Um, but yeah, I mean, they, they found, it was interesting, um, in terms of trying to work out the logistics between an American university on our semester system, where we start in the fall. And, um, so that actually was something I had to get used to coming over to NEC as well. So the New Zealand academic year runs from, at university, runs from February through November. So the academic year fits in the calendar year. So it's none of this 2021 things. It's like, say the name of the year and that's your academic year. So my students had to negotiate, you know, depending on whether they were coming over and what would have been our fall semester, which was the end of the year you know, the second semester uh, in New Zealand, because of the seasons being opposite. Or if they're coming in our spring se uh, semester, then they're, going, they're um, starting a new academic year. So there was that element. There was the, the juggling of things. Um, Julie and I were talking about um, that in New Zealand, um, something that we would think of as a course, perhaps, in the US is called a paper. 
And so um, you'll take this number of papers. And of course, if you're coming from the US, you might think, wait, I have to write a paper? I have to do a dissertation? What, 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 what? And it's just, it's just, again, using the English language in different ways. Um, but there, there are, you know, quite an, it's, it's fantastic. I, I encourage um, my students to try and do international uh, exchange study if they can, um, because it's very, very eye-opening. But there are definitely some logistics involved in terms of having the classes count towards the degree back back home again when they, once they return. So what you know, what is the equivalent? Uh, course, what is the equivalent level? What do we, how do we make this work for the people at, at, at both ends? Um, it's, it's complicated. So Michael, I would love to hear more about the online database of works for bassoon by underrepresented composers. I believe that the, the author slash compiler of this is uh, Adam Burford, uh, if I'm uh, remembering correctly, okay. um, but it's it's a a um, it's a database of music by um, people of different uh, gender uh, identification of different um, racial and and um, uh, underrepresented or as as is now becoming uh, a better way of of describing many of them. Um, historically ignored mm -hmm. groups of composers. And in, in the spreadsheet, um, it has tabs along the bottom. And so I think it defaults to open to the chain music one. But if the, I want to say the second one, okay, actually, let me just open it briefly here. So solo featuring uh, is the second tab over but yeah, so it is, just to read the title, in case any of you don't have it open, Bassoon Music by Wim Nixon, I'm not sure, Women Nixon, Transgender and Gender Diverse Individuals and or Black, Indigenous or Persons of Colour. And so um, I think that it's especially um, in the current climate that Know, sort of erupted during 2020. Yes, Brandon Rumsey. I think did I said the wrong name. I might have said the wrong name. Um, um, I think it's really important that we really investigate the decolonization of our repertoire. And it's not that we're going to throw all of the old standards and classics out the window. I think the Mozart bassoon concerto is never going to be ignored by all bassoonists. And if they were to find any of the other three, I think there would be a furor in the in the bassoon community um, appropriately. But the fact that you know people of different genders and races have been traditionally ignored, overlooked. Um, sometimes, you know, things have been rewritten or, or claimed to be by a man when it was actually by his wife, sister, mother, what have you. Um, and so having compilations of things like this to look at. Now, most of the music we're going to find on here is more contemporary, but there are some pieces that are known about that are um, a little bit older and, and certainly, definitely worthy of, of exploration. There's a wonderful um, CD that uh, Lacoli and Washington did of, of music by, by um, African-American composers and stuff. And it's starting to be now that, that people are recognizing more and more the need for greater representation of, of some of these pieces. And there's some really wonderful pieces to be found. So for me, this is this is a great resource. As I, I, and I send it out to all my students and encourage them to, to try and find. Um, it's not compulsory, typically, but if they can find some music 
in here that that um, is at the right level, and and you know I think we can work on some things. And there are, there are some pieces in lists such as this that one could substitute for pieces by um, dead white European males um, who have had more than their fair share of the, the repertoire being played. So I mean I think I think it can be you know really great just to sort of um, go through this and. If, if you see a hot link on the piece, then it quite often will take you to a you know, YouTube video of somebody performing it, or perhaps it will, you know, there are some will take you to the composer's page, or to a publisher, or a distributor, and things of that sort. So it's very well done. There are also means if people you know, look at this list and know of other pieces and, or other composers that you can submit for them to, to update the database. So it should be a living database that gets expanded as, as things go along, as long as people that know about it um, you know, uh, spread the word so that, that if there are composers and, and pieces that are, that are missing, that we try to get those to respond. The Bone People by Carrie Holm. Could you share a bit more about that book and how you came across it? So, um, one of the things that uh, I did in between finishing up my undergraduate degree in November and starting my master's degree in the following August or whatever it was, um, there were several months there that I needed to find employment and, and work and stuff. And I did some um, temp jobs, and one of one of them was a one-day job for the um, uh, government printing house uh, in Wellington, New Zealand. And they liked me so much that they hired me back for like the next week, and I did work for them the next week. And they liked me so much that they kept on hiring me back. And basically, I ended up becoming a uh, almost full-time. Position. They kept on trying to convince me I didn't need to go to Boston, that they could, I could just stay there and work for them. And they would have um, book awards. And so I started to learn a little bit about some New Zealand authors. And Kerry Holm is a, a New Zealand author. And, and the Bone People um, did win awards um, in New Zealand, but it also won some international awards. And it is, um, it's very dark, I will say. Um, but it's uh, incredibly well written, and it, it sort of ties together some um, Maori and New Zealand uh, mythology with a sort of a modern day, um, I guess you could almost say, how would I categorize it? Almost like a, like a psychological thriller with almost a, some elements of... of um, um, well, with the sort of mythological things in there, so there's, there's sort of some, some some elements of not a cult exactly, but but just anyway, there's there's some very dark things, but it's so well written and it really really brings you in. And I guess I wanted to use that as a as a um, an example of there are some really wonderful New Zealand um, authors that are not as well known. Um, there have also been some New Zealand authors that have had some some um, of some books that have been turned into film, and so um, there's one called the Whale, a film called the Whale Rider, um, uh, based on a New Zealand book. Um, I think that's Fiti uh, Hamira, uh, but um, anyway, it's a it's a also got definitely some of the Maori, which is the Polynesian race. Um, native to New Zealand, um, sort of mythology um, elements in that as well. And I think that that's, that's an undercurrent in New Zealand with a lot of things that, that, that New Zealand is trying pretty hard, even though it is definitely part of the British Commonwealth, <laughs> and, and noticeably so, it is trying to be a multicultural society and have become more and more aware of the fact that Maori culture doesn't exist anywhere except New Zealand, so that they need to, you know, 
all of the road signs, all of the government buildings, all of that sort of things in New Zealand have both a Maori and, and an English name on them. Um, so there's definitely a national identity that is associated with, with the fact that we are a Pacific island. So, and I think the Bone People, you know, illustrates that pretty well, as do some of these these other books as well. Could you tell us about your YouTube channel and the videos that you share? Sure. Um, I have a YouTube channel. No. Um, <laughs> I, I accidentally sort of have, have have more than one, I think, because okay. uh, of how I've had to, to sign into to YouTube at various times. Um, with with the the Google overlords making it that I have to sign in with my my UNCG uh, credentials now, some of the things that I posted uh, previously haven't haven't played well with the current ones. But it consists of um, some combinations of maybe things that I have uh, compositions of mine that that. Um, sometimes that I'm the one playing them, sometimes that other people are playing, um, of me performing things which might be my own pieces or might be other people's pieces. There are occasionally things like um, some, a couple of ensemble pieces that I have um, transcribed or arranged and things and that have been done here and there and just sort of put them on the channel. One of the things that during the the, um, the pandemic, when everything had to become online, that I began, and I've actually got a pretty long page of next ones to get to, um, are some some short, in, trying to be short, maybe five minutes or less, um, pedagogical videos, and. Uh, we actually, the UNCG faculty got asked to do some of these, and I, 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 I did produce some for them, and then I decided to go back and redo some, some sort of under my own auspices. Um, and part of it too, uh, my wife is a flute player, and there is a uh, wonderful English flute player who, who has sort of done something like this, and I'm blanking on his name. Um, she'll kill me that I can't think of it. But anyway, um, he, he was he's like a superstar that was you know principal in the London film and stuff, and he would do these little four or five minute videos. Um, Davies is his last name. Um, Gareth Davies. Anyway, he has done several of these sort of um, quick and to the point videos, and my wife showed me some of those and said, "You should do something like this for the scene." So I've sort of been doing some and, and as I said I've got I've got a, a long list and I thought that by now in the summer I would have actually been sitting down and doing them but somehow I seem to fritter away my days without doing so so perhaps before school starts up again yay in person um, uh, I will attempt to get to some some more of those but I do find like the, there have been some very nice reactions from people about some things like that because I think, you know, as we were talking about the bassoon in New Zealand and, and, and the US, maybe in both places, but maybe particularly in the US, but also, who knows, elsewhere in the world, there can be a bassoonist. And if they're not somewhere near a larger metropolitan area, then there may well not be anybody anywhere close to them that is available for lessons, you know, if you're, if you're close to somebody in a symphony or, at a, or in a college position or something, that's one thing, and that's great if that's possible. But if you're not, then having access to some hopefully quick and hopefully easy um, you know, pedagogical concepts can be, can be good. So I want to go through, there's definitely a number of things that I want to do. And it, it, it's interesting, too, when you... There are some, some concepts that I do that I'm like, how can I possibly make this into a five minute thing? And then I realize I can break it down into some component parts and, and, and you know, break those things down and, and, and tie some things together and say, if you want more information about this, then watch video number, whatever it is. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, just kind of um, bring those together. So that that's certainly 
something that I'm aiming to do. So that, that's probably going to be what most new content will be on, um, on that YouTube uh, channel. However, it's probably also going to be the, uh, as it has been, the dumping ground of some of the performances <laughs> and other things that have cropped up. We can go ahead and end this session here. It has been such a joy. Thank <laughs> you.